Welcome to Lifespot.com, where we prove ancient medical wisdom with modern science. I'm Dr. John Duyard, and welcome to our podcast today. We have a, a really special guest, Dr. Zach Bush, uh, a, uh, a, a originated from right here in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, he's a, a rare medical doctor, PhD, he's triple board certified, uh, one of the few doctors that are triple board certified in the country. So it's a real delight to have someone who can speak from the medical side and the research side. Uh, uh, you're gonna love this interview. He's, his expertise is in uh, endocrinology, medicine, metabolism, as well as hospice and palliative care. Um, he, um, his science has done so many breakthrough studies that we're gonna talk about today about the microbiome, his work on glyphosate, how we can avoid the damage to the digestive system on glyphosate uh, is just profound. I think you're going to really understand at a much deeper level how the gut works and why it's not working and what we can do to fix it. So that's going to be really, really exciting. And he has a lot to say about how we can make radical change in all of the, the big industries, big farming, big pharma, um, and of course, Western medicine, who is just you know, sort of a disease-oriented uh, a disease-oriented system of medicine. And, and uh, you know, as we speak from ancient medicalism, Ayurvedic medicine, and modern science, I think that's why I'm so happy to have Dr. Bush here with us. Dr. Bush, welcome. Uh, great to have you here. Wonderful to be on board. Thank you all for including me with your audience and everything else. It's exciting. And minor tweak is I'm not the PhD. I'm the MD, a uh, medical uh, doctor, researcher, my team of PhDs uh, that work with me are phenomenal. So I've got great depth on the PhD and MD PhD underneath me and everything else. So if you hear a bunch of cool wisdom and science from me, know that it's probably not just from my brain, but from the great greater depth of wisdom uh, that surrounds me. You know, thank you for that. I apologize for that. Um, you're so brilliant. I just assumed uh, where I got that. I just I don't... I try to give me an honorary PhD. So there you go. You got it from here. Life spot PhD. Um, <laughs> So, you know, what we talk about here at, at LifeSpa is, you know, the, the deeper understanding. Like in Ayurvedic medicine, we don't treat the patient. We, we don't treat the disease. We treat the patient, right? We understand that at the deepest fundamental level that they, we are all this inner intelligence, this inner experience of silence. And, you know, you talk a lot about that, that from a scientific perspective, that there's actually real science to really back that up. And I always talk about the more we can access that calm, you know, one of the great sayings in Ayurveda is that, that we establish being, become more still, and then perform action from that silence. And that's how we hail. Like the bigger the eye of the storm, the more powerful the winds. And if we can function from the, from the eye of the storm, then we're not getting beat up by refrigerators and big trees getting clobbered in, in the winds of the storm. And that is where Ayurveda comes from. It's a science of longevity and a science of transformation and a science of unlimited human potential. So I think that from that perspective, we have a lot to talk about, and then I want to then go and dive into the nitty gritty of the gut and the microbiome and, and go from there. So, so I'd love to hear your take on, you know, how do we access that eye of the storm at a cellular level and then function from that deep place of calm? Oh my gosh, it's so good. I, I'm going to steal almost everything you just said. It was so perfect. So um, the, the silence is definitely an uh, interesting concept at the cellular level. Uh, you know, the, the extraordinary oversight that we've had as a Western medicine science, you know, mediated or science centric team uh, in Western medicine. And I'd say the United States is maybe the most uh, off track on this, because if you look at almost any other developed world that practices allopathic medicine, they still keep their foot in the natural medicines. And so Europe is steeped in homeopathy. Um, you know, Iceland actually was right there 1,500 years ago developing their own uh, acupuncture system. You know, so like you look at Europe and that, and then of course you've got India and the Ayurvedic medicine and you've got the Middle East uh, with a lot of its formal traditions, Africa, it's all herbalism and, and nutritional uh, science and nutritional uh, well-being there. And then you go into Asia and obviously you've got uh, ancient Chinese medicine and the like, uh, and then Japanese deep culture. So interestingly, the United States is just like this white glaring obvious, you know, step, step off the cliff of traditional medicine right into pure pharmaceutical allopathic medicine. And of course, it wasn't always like that. I'd say the big 
big drop off happened sometime in the 1970s. And interestingly, I think it was a pushback to what was happening in the 1960s. Uh, at that time, we had Royal Rife and a lot of brilliant scientists that were showing the fact that human biology doesn't exist outside of the physics. And that's what we let go of in the 70s and 80s. We started to, to view the human body as a machine, a mechanism that we could see under the microscope. And we de developed the CAT scans and the MRIs and all these imaging systems so we could see the internal organs. And we came to believe this very Newtonian, old-fashioned belief system about the body that, oh, it's all machines, enzymes are like these little machines, and everything's very mechanical. When in, if anybody has ever experienced healing, or if anybody's seen a child fall and, and scuff their knee and suddenly heal that in two days to the point where there's no scarring, it's just perfect skin, that ability to heal it goes way beyond any mechanism of just machinery. There is something invisible about the nature of health. And the invisibility is coming out of the biophysics, not the cellular environment. And the biophysics, of course, defines the 99.999% of the cell because 99.999% of every atom is vacuum space. And so the 0.0001% of the atom that's solid will go on to manifest a vibrational coordination that will give the appearance of solidity. But neither you or I sitting in our respective locations or the chairs we sit on or anything else is solid. Everything is vacuum space with the organization of energy creating the perception of solidity. And so that solid nature that we've come to believe in in Western medicine, I think, is very much responsible for our complete disconnect from the reality of, of healing. When you believe that the machine is damaged and beyond, damaged beyond the point of repair, which is, you know, my research was actually in cancer at the University of Virginia, and so I was developing chemotherapy 10 years ago. And so that, that mindset that I was in at the time was, oh, these are damaged cells that can no longer repair themselves, and they're too damaged to know how to shut themselves down and cell suicide, so they need a toxin. And so we need to kill these things, and we need to kill these things, and we need to kill these things. And then you back up and say, well, wait a second, we, we never had a cancer epidemic, you know, like anything like we see today, until we started to, to change the nature of communication down at, at the cellular level. And this is, we'll come back again and again, I suspect this communication issue, because it has to do with the silence that you started at. Ultimately, you'll find that self-identity in the spiritual pursuit has again and again pointed back to the processes of fasting, meditation, prayer, spiritual song, you know, I don't care what people group, what religion, these things are bedrock in our momentum towards spiritual awareness. Mm -hmm. It's not surprising then that in the biology, we find out now in the last five years, oh my gosh, if there is silence to the point of being able to hear self-identity at the cellular level, unbelievable amount of repair and healing goes on. And not only healing, but I would say regenerative uh, where you actually end up stronger, not weaker. And that's the same that you would expect for a spiritual journey. And it's certainly the same thing we expect in an acute inflammatory environment where there's an injury and there's a response. And the response makes you stronger, not weaker. In this way, we're finding that self-identity and the pursuit of it does have to do with silence. But we didn't know that at the time when I started out. And so I went from a chemotherapy researcher to nutrition guy based on the fact that my chemotherapy that was being becoming kind of a new paradigm and thought processes around chemo, instead of trying to toxify the cell to kill it with a poison, we were starting to work with mitochondria, which are the metabolism guys that kind of make the fuel in your body, but they also happen to be the guys that regulate cell suicide. And so it turns out these non-human entities that look a lot like bacteria that live inside your cells are capable of turning on cell suicide and which means that a cancer cell or any cell that's overly damaged can remove itself from the system without an immune system. This is a paradigm leap in cancer management, obviously, because you know up until this point, we said, well, cancer happens when your immune surveillance goes down, you can no longer find those damaged cells and all that, and that's our current paradigm. What I would argue is it's, it has nothing to do with your immune system or its efficiency, and it has much more to do with, can the machinery within your cells turn on the mechanisms of cell suicide or identify enough of a problem that it calls in a functional immune system. And so the, the mitochondria are a huge piece of that. And so back in the day, I had no idea about silence, but I had everything to do in my science around the noise. 
So I was studying, studying the static, if you will, that was making all of the noise for these cancer cells that they lost track of that silent self-identity. The static and the noise, that was that white noise that was on top of everything, turns out to be chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation, in your mindset as a listener or as a practitioner, you think of maybe red toe when you stub your toe or something inflamed or whatever, but down at the cellular level, what's happening is all of these signals for help are going out. And so this is called oxidative stress, where your immune system is dumping stress, your cells that are damaged are dumping stress. Everybody's calling for stress, 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 stress to try to call for help. So it's sending out this massive uh, signal for help, but now, you know, you can imagine yourself as the Coast Guard, you get a SOS out in the ocean, you go zipping right to it and bring in the resources and everything's taken care of. Now you change the scenario to 2000 ships are in the bay and just got hit by a hurricane. And now your six boats that are where they're supposed to be your Coast Guard are completely overwhelmed by 2000 SOS signals at once. And now there's so much chaos in the field that you can't decide who you're gonna go help, which of the boats are more important, which ones are gonna save the most number of people, all of these things in, a, in kind of a, an overwhelmed emergency reaction system is exactly what chronic inflammation looks like. Way too much alert, way too much calls for help, you've overwhelmed your coping mechanisms, the antioxidants, the peptide signaling cascade, and now you're just in noise chaos. And you're in a fight or flight state. That is the condition of humanity now. And I don't think it takes any leap of the imagination to realize the rhetoric that we have in our politics, the rhetoric that we have on the evening news, the rhetoric we have in our churches and synagogues and other holy places has become so inflamed. And we have become more and more isolationist in our reactionism because there's so much noise. There's so much calls for help. There's so much emergency, emergency, emergency that the only way to do is retract back into something like Facebook and YouTube and watch cat videos all day. You know, so it's like, we've got this amazing social structure and my kids are 20 and 18. And that's where, why I think of the cat videos, my daughter's like steeped in that kind of world of like, whatever is the funniest video trending today, she's likely to know. And so the, I think our generations are showing this general chaos in the communication stream. And we all have access to the communication stream and we all hear desperate noise and it's having, making it very difficult for us as adults or developing adults or children to find self-identity, to find a moment of silence, to know who we are, where we come from, why we're here right now and where we're headed. That sounds like the kind of age old wisdom that anybody would have and they would set their whole life on. The extraordinary thing we're starting to see in clinic over the last eight years is that if you can create the silence at the cell level, the greater system of awareness, the self recognition, the boundaries that we build at the cellular level through cell cell communication and the silence there. If you build a healthy boundary on the front end of your immune system, this is your gut uh, system. So your intestinal lining is the largest exposure you have to the outside world. It's your largest barrier between who you're not and who you are. So the immune system sits behind that gut lining because of the known vulnerability. So you are designed uh, with 70% of your immune system in one location, the, the two or three millimeters that are deep to your intestinal lining. And that immune system is ready to respond to outside world. And the way that it programs is immediately as soon as it's stimulated, it should have the ability to then signal the body, okay, this is outside foreigner that I'm now gonna attack and I'm not gonna attack self. I know the difference between outside and inside. And so that's kind of what a silent system looks like. Again, we go back to the Coast Guard model. Radio is silent, everything is well, suddenly there's an SOS, there's an immediate response, you save the boat, you pull back within six hours, everything's taken care of, paperwork is filled out, all of the bureaucratic system is happy. Now you start to overwhelm that radio channel of your immune system with holes in your intestinal lining all over the place. We call this leaky gut in, in medical practice. By the way, leaky gut was in the, in the vocab of naturopaths and chiropractors and even like massage therapists for a decade before I could embrace that word. 
I thought the word leaky gut was the stupidest thing I had ever heard when I first heard it as an allopathic doctor, because the whole concept of the gut is to absorb stuff. And it is a leaky membrane by its design is what I thought, but I was wrong. Again, it comes down to what is intelligent absorption and what is just overwhelm. And, and so there's a huge difference between a hole in the membrane and a membrane that can open and close portals in a controlled fashion. Let me, let me uh, catch up with you just a second and kind of connect some ancient wisdom dots. When you talk about cancer cells in Ayurvedic medicine, they talk about a smirti, memory, memory of the cell. And cells, it's described as they lose the memory of proper function. They start to function as rogue cells because they've lost the connection of how to divide and become two cells in a normal way. The blood can't get in, the waste can't get out, toxins build up, the cells decides, hey, we're going to die here and uh, we got to do something. So either die or we figure out a way to divide in an abnormal way. And the immune system says, hands off. We're going to let you guys do it. You're impoverished. You got no money. We're going to take, we're going to let you guys do your thing. That's the cancer response. In, in an autoimmune response, the immune system sort of overreacts in an overzealous way and takes out not only the bad, but the good. In Ayurvedic medicine, and I talk a lot about this to my listeners, and I, and I know you know about this and talk about this as well, we talk a lot about the lymphatic system. One aspect of Ayurveda is called Rasayana, which is the study of longevity. The word rasa means lymph, and it's the study of the lymphatic system. And we know that at the gut associated lymphatic tissue starts inside your gut is 70% of your immune system. We know that there's brain lymphatics that drain three pounds of chemicals and plaque out of your brain lymph every year while we sleep that are newly discovered. Ayurveda talked about those thousands of years ago, how to detoxify those thousands of years ago for migraine headaches and inflammation and autoimmunity and all these kinds of things. And, and I know that you know the science behind how that, number one, you know, elaborate maybe a little bit if you could on, on the, the relationship of a cancer cell losing its memory, but then also as you're getting ready to dive into the gut lining, the relationship with the gut associated lymphatic tissue and how important that is for for everything and how it relates to skin associated lymph and respiratory lymph and, and how all the barriers break down as a result of, of first and foremost poor lymphatic function or congested lymphatic function and then eventually everything defaults from the intestinal lymph to the gut to the, back to the liver and then the liver and digestion becomes compromised and that's sort of where I'd love to, to go if we could today uh, is you know go into that digestive detail a little bit yeah, After, spot on. Tell, me, tell me about cancer first, though, from that perspective of memory. Yeah, it's a beautiful description. And I would say so, the autoimmune is a similar phenomenon uh, in a different direction. And so the, the cancer cell is one that really teaches us something profound about the fabric from which we're made, is that a cancer cell is inherently extraordinarily damaged. Uh, the average in our cancer patients, so we actually will take a biopsy uh, from our patients and m multiple times now we've put those cells into culture, immortalize those, that cell line so that we can actually study, you know, what is that tumor going to respond to in the world. And uh, what we see and again and again as we genetically sequence those tumors is that there's usually between 20 and 25,000 unrepaired injuries at the genome which is a pretty extraordinary number because there's only 20,000 human genes. And so a lot of those damages are happening outside the genes and what we call the junk DNA, which we now know is not junk. It's actually the regulatory piece of the, the genome. But a lot of those are in the genes themselves. So we have all this damaged genomic information that's now keeping that cell from reproducing normally and from uh, you know, knowing how to repair itself. The interesting thing is that for that cell to decide to start to proliferate, it has to make one more jump. And that jump has to be one of a belief that it is the only thing of life left. You need to lice every connection that cell has to the greater organism before it really becomes a cancer cell. Wow. It determines a cancer cell that goes metastatic and kills the person versus a tumor that grows and really never hurts the person. We know that 70% of males at 70 years old have prostate cancer. Well, the majority of those will never find out they have prostate cancer and they will never die of prostate cancer. The tumor there is started to proliferate, but it hasn't completely lost its connection with the greater organism. It's still got some sort of enough of a connection that there's a, a, something preventing it from going metastatic. 
And so ultimately cancer is about isolation. A cancer cell is the loneliest cell in the body and it doesn't know it's part of your larger organism anymore. And at that moment, it's only option. It can't repair now. It can't, it's, it's not connected to any larger organism. So it's literally the last man alive. And that thing starts to proliferate as its only option for survival. It's a very short lived cell because it is so damaged and can't repair. And so it has to proliferate fast. The more damaged the cell, the faster it's gonna have to reproduce. And so the most aggressive cancers out there, neuroendocrine carcinoma, pancreatic cancer, these kinds of tumors that are, can have doubling times of two weeks where they're just growing, growing, growing so fast. Those are extremely damaged cells that are the most vulnerable, the weakest, and ultimately the loneliest cells in our body. And what do we do to respond as scientists and doctors? Well, we should try to kill that thing. Can you imagine? And I I'm afraid we have done this as humans as well. We have often looked at the most marginalized, the most downtrodden humans, and we will abuse them and we will take advantage of them. And so I feel like we're doing the same thing often in the macro world as we are at the micro world, making the same mistakes over and over again. If at the moment you were diagnosed with cancer, you said, oh my God, I have lung cancer? Wow, fascinating. There is a part of me in my lungs that I have so disregarded in my being that I have left so lonely, so ignored, that it would only have one choice left in this preservation of life. And it has to preserve life because that's the telling thing about the fabric we're made of. At the very basic fabric level, you have a drive for life. And so that cancer cell, now lonely, now forgotten about, has drive, has drive for life. And instead of celebrating that and recognizing it, we, it, we put fear into it, we put guilt into it, we have all these negative emotions and then we start pounding it with chemo and trying to kill this, this highly damaged, lonely, marginalized cell. Where what I like to do in my clinic, the first visit with a patient who's got cancer is help them A, see that, and then suddenly change their relationship to that diagnosis, change their relationship and say, what an opportunity do you have to become whole for the first time in your life? Because for you to develop a tumor cell for you to develop a cancer somewhere in your body, you've had to have a long, long standing, decades of disconnect from that space in your body. That's a tragedy. And it's been undermining your sense of wholeness, your sense of purpose, your sense of incapacity for repair, your capacity for resilience, your capacity for fulfilling your purpose to the fullest. And I have heard many, many times over the years from my cancer patients, a year, year and a half in, they will have made such transformation in that time when they came from this different perspective that they will again and again tell me, Zach, this, this cancer was the most important thing that ever happened to me. It's so, funny that, it's so funny that you actually say that, those exact words, because I came back from India studying in, in India in 1986 and I met Deepak Chopra in India. He was just starting an Ayurvedic cancer center in Massachusetts. I came back to co-direct that with him. I was there for eight years and basically saw nothing but cancer patients with him for all those years. Hmm. And I always tell the story and I use those exact words. People would do Western medicine, they do natural medicine. Some did a little bit of both, some did one or the other. But the ones that really did the best were the ones who could look me in the eye and say, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, so I think, you know, from that perspective, it's about memory, restoring that wholeness at, at, at every level, at the level of treatment, at the level of restoring, you know, bro a broken down digestive system uh, and a a damaged, maybe traumatized, nervous, emotional system as well. So I love what you're saying. It's just so so amazing that that you're you're finding the science to back that up. So my question then is: Is there any science to suggest that if you do embrace it on a mental, emotional level, not just a physical level, or even both, is there science to show that these cells actually do repair if you if you if you sort of energetically, emotionally embrace the body as a whole? It's almost more beautiful than that. I mean, uh, what we see under the microscope happen uh, when, you, when you reconnect the cell to, to its original source, rather than then demanding the resources to take itself from highly damaged back to repair and all these things, it simply defers. And it's, it is a, such a humble thing that that cancer cell does. 
it says, oh my gosh, I, as soon as you reconnect and it receives the information that you are one of 70 trillion human cells, you need to reconnect. And, and once it is reconnected, it simply says, wow, let me get out of the way. Let me step aside and let a stem cell come in, replace me, and I'll have a ha healthy lung cell or whatever it is. And so we see these tumors go into apoptosis, which is programmed su cell suicide, which again is fascinating. There's a humility at the cell level that that would be its response of, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't need to have drive for life. The organism has drive for life that will replace me and I will have legacy, right? Can you imagine the, the sense of an informed cell knowing that it's part of an infinite legacy of life rather than the last piece of life? There Is must that, be joy at that cellular level even. <laughs> was the trigger meditation, prayer? What was the trigger of that silence? Oh, it's, it's everything, right? And for, so we've, we've kind of distilled down over the last eight, you know, decade eight major areas that are completely necessary for human health and healing to happen. And these are big categories of science and, and technologies and stuff like this. And so there's a lot of, you know, for every one of those eight points, you could have a dozen or two dozen different, you know, modalities or therapies or you know, interventions that could kind of meet that, that point of the, the, the tetrahedron. But uh, that varies per person. And so we all have a thumbprint of the way in which we carry stress, the way in which we see the world, and that thumbprint will show us that for some of us, we just need literal meditation and prayer and we'll see healing. And if you've ever been in a, a church or a synagogue or, or spiritual environment long enough, you have seen those cases. You've had some person who's come in with some life-threatening disease, been given three weeks to live, and 15 years later, they're alive, thriving, they don't have that disease. That happens so often that we shouldn't even call that a miracle. That just, that happens. And we've all been one degree of separation, if not, closer to that reality of these miracles. So there's that level of like, you know, just need prayer and meditation. I would say most of us need probably a minimum three or four of those, you know, pieces of the puzzle corrected. And not one of those cases have I not seen the meditation prayer and the shift in relationship to your disease, your shift in relationship to your sense of who you are as self not be one of those. So that that's like the must. So you've never met somebody who has cancer that doesn't have that piece of the puzzle. And I think that's because I don't think there's a human out there that doesn't have that piece of the puzzle. Right. That yeah. is the condition is we are separated from our infinite, you know, self identity at the soul level that goes back probably to the beginning of time. And we have that soul trying to act through these frail human bodies with a bunch of programming telling us that we are just frail bodies and we don't know anything when we're born. And so we need to be taught stuff and we need to memorize stuff from human wisdom and human knowledge, all of which is half wrong or whatever it is. And then we end up confused and lost at the end of life. That, that of course is an erroneous model. And we see that with everything from, you know, Buddha and, you know, all of the, the Eastern thought all the way down to, you know, the, the deep Kabbalah and the Jewish religion and the Christianity, like you go to any piece and you'll find that the whole story is, you know, everything within you, in your core, you know, all you are a source of wisdom. You are plugged into the infinite. There is singularity, blah, blah, blah. Well, that, if that becomes our model for our sense of wellness, we will simply build a different system. And I think that your, your work with Deepak is a great example. You know, you can go and build an Ayurvedic center and um, it's a, a fun thing to see these environments starting to really shift. And now that I know what you do, I'm, I'm interested to tell you about this Ayurvedic project we've got uh, in a health center down in Florida. But um, you know, the, suffice it to say that, that your podcast is probably one of the best microcosms you can come up with is if we aren't using technology to further understand the ancient wisdom, then we're missing an enormous opportunity that we have. What a cool thing to be born right now. We are at the friggin' tipping yeah. point of humanity. Seven billion of us showed up right now in all space, time, and, and everything else. We showed up right now for this extraordinary tipping point of this experiment of human life. Are we gonna tip it over the edge and go extinct in the next 50 years? Or over the next 250 years, are we going to build a Garden of Eden that's never been witnessed before because we start to understand our role and not just ours as humans, technology's role 
and not, you know, information age role, all these things were not so that YouTube could be created. We're not so that Facebook could be created. We're not so that Microsoft could be created, not that the World Bank could be created. These things, I think, are stepping stones to the, the potential of letting the human become part of the creative process. Let the human become part of the creative nature that would have us plugged into a regenerative healing process, not just for human health, but for the health of the planet, but also for the rise of the planet. We're scratching the surface of, of potential of biology, even in the soil. Much of our work is extracting bacterial and fungal information from fossil soils 60 million years ago. And we cannot find that kind of information in modern soil. And so even at our dirt, we've become impaired. We've become dumbed down, if you will. We've lost intelligence in our very soils that we would grow the foods that would feed our livestock, that would feed our children, that would feed the whole world. All of that is coming from a depleted, low energy state now and so we see 46% of our children with a chronic disease. We see one in three adults with cancer. We see you know, this incredible epidemic of, of autism in our children that is moving towards one in three children with autism by 2035. All of these things are screaming at us that we're disconnected. If we have screwed up just the soil and we brought that back to 60 million years ago, we would see a thrive of the human being like never experienced. Our longevity would go through the roof our uh, life trajectory would completely change. Currently, by 18 months of age, we can show radical aging happening within the, hu the human cell. And so we are born, we barely start to learn how to walk, and we're already aging. We're already moving towards the grave. I don't think that was the pattern that nature had designed. I think we can be born, thrive as an adult creature for a long period of time, and then a sudden decline when we give up our spirit and ready for for a regenerative transformative experience. That pattern would extend wisdom into our children. Watching the 10 parts documentary on the Vietnam War right now, if you guys haven't watched this, you know, even if you lived through it, you need to do this. You know, and it was at the beginning of my life that you know, Vietnam was fin finally wrapping up and everything else. And to look back just that one generation before I was born and realize the patterns that we have re-perpetuated over the last two decades, we didn't even carry that for 20 years. We didn't even carry the wisdom taken out of that experience for 20 years before we started making the same mistakes again. That's my concern is that if we don't create silence at the cell level, if you know, we in, don't wash it. In, um, in Ayurveda, there's something called living a sattvic lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of loving, giving, joyful, and kind. And, and I've, Found study after study after study says if you stress the body out, the microbiome becomes compromised, good bugs flourish, you know, disappear and bad bugs flourish. The sattvic lifestyle is the other side of that coin. Actually engaging in behavior that is loving, giving, kind, joyful, extending your telomeres with meditation, you know, mm. uh, boosting oxytocin levels, which you know is the longevity hormone. All this science saying that, 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 you know, that really good things happen when we give love and care but there's so much more science showing that when you stress the body out, all this bad stuff happens. When you look at an evolutionary sense, bad stuff didn't happen that much of the time. It was a random event chased by a lion. But most of the time, you were, in, you were instilled with the silence of nature, in tune with that, in rhythm with that. Um, you know, meditation uh, hacks, it upregulates over 2,000 you know, positive genes for us. So meditation is sort of a, a way for us to, or in prayer, to dip into that silence that in evolutionary sense we may have had connection to for, for many, many millions of years. So I wonder if you've run across science that actually does show that when you actually do what the, the, the ancient wisdom says, which is to actually engage in loving and giving and kindful behavior, that that actually changes the microbiome. Because we know the stress screws it up. But do we have the science on the other side, the positive side? And I feel like we miss that. We do all this negative science, but we don't do the positive science. But I think what you're talking about, to change the microbiome, to change the, micro, the gut brain access, to change everything, we have to convince the body cell by cell, it's safe. Safe enough for yeah. them to divide and do their thing, right? Yes, that safety is a huge piece of it. Yeah, and, and, and after any trauma, if you reset the body through body tapping or whatever you want to do, to realize really quickly that, it, oh, it's safe now. Like, 
major event. You had to go into this major fight or flight state. Now it's over. And it might be only three minutes from when that trauma happened. But if you remind the body at that moment, okay, now you're safe. Right. You, know you have to be in that fight or flight stance. You go fix it. The faster you can shut down that stress pattern, the more regenerative everything stays. And that does include the microbiome. And so we do have good science now showing that if you have an emotional stress, it changes the microbiome. And vice versa, if you shut down the emotional stress and your cortisol levels go back to a diurnal pattern, norepinephrine, epinephrine fall, vagal tone then falls, which changes the motility of the gut as to the movement of material through your gut, you're going to change the microflora within minutes, if not in hours. But certainly within the day, you've changed your microbiome by realigning with your parasympathetic digestive relaxation metabolic pathways rather than your fight or flight mobilization damage control kind of pathways so we right. absolutely know the opposite already and that's again uh, uh, fascinating that it's an interspecies event right because with the cancer autoimmune disease and now the microbiome all of those are having to do with non-human cells there's three species of mitochondria that live inside our cells that's kind of interesting it's a very small niche life on planet but you can't have a single multicellular organism whether that's a worm or a human without mitochondria and so these bacteria like organisms that live inside of our cells and proliferate inside our cells are critical to survival and to thrive and ultimately to self-identity and so that we would rely on the microbiome's ability to maintain the barrier systems and we haven't actually gone into that i guess here on this podcast yet, but the, the barrier systems of the gut that was protecting that lymphatic tissue that we talked about, that that immune system piece is the barriers there are tight junctions. And tight junctions are like the intelligent portals in the wall of the gut and in the wall of your blood vessels, the wall of your blood brain barrier, the wall of your kidney tubules. So these Velcro-like proteins define these important boundaries throughout the body to create that silence we've been talking about. Well, it turns out that we've shown in the lab over the last six years that as soon as you screw up the microbiome and you lose that communication network of the bacteria and the fungi, your cell doesn't know to make more extracellular matrix. And so you start to become depleted in these Velcro proteins. And then any attack, whether it's from alcohol, medications, or now the most ubiquitous of the toxins on the planet, the glyphosate that you mentioned in the intro, glyphosate's the active ingredient Roundup and almost all of the other herbicides or weed killers on the planet. And so we're drinking Roundup, we're eating Roundup, 70% of our rainfall has got Roundup, 75% of our air has Roundup. It's just, the numbers go on and on, ridiculous of how much we're steeped in this chemical. And it's fascinating that this chemical is an antibiotic, i.e. it's killing the bacteria, fungi, and I'm sure the mitochondria. And it's, it's undermining the ability of the nucleus of the human cell to be informed as to what this extracellular barrier system needs to be. As soon as we take the, the communication network from that ancient soil and we put that back into play in, a, in an active form, you get this enormous intelligence coming out of the, the human system. And the first thing it does is make boundary. It makes barrier systems. And that, that's so logical. If you don't have the boundaries up, you're just going to keep damaging yourself. So there's something profound about that that we should all learn in and of ourselves. And I'm still learning this spiritually and kind of emotionally is that when I'm really being dragged down and other people are dragging energy out of me, it's probably because I, I let one of my boundaries down. There's healthy boundaries in our lives, spiritually, emotionally, relationally. There are healthy boundaries to maintain and make sure you're not in a codependent relationship and you're not being leached into these relationships and emotionally drained find those holes, plug the hole, and you'll find that you heal without effort. Instead of having to go through 60 years of therapy, close the boundary and you're going to find health and healing and, and it all come out because you just created the silence. And so that's very cool that the first thing that the human body does at the nuclear level, it mobilizes from the DNA, the proteins that would make your boundaries first, and then goes about the rest of the journey towards healing. And so boundaries up, Bacteria and fungi are responsible for that. Fascinating. You don't have self-identity without your microbiome. That's a pretty radical thought. And then you can't heal and you can't do the apoptosis program cell suicide to get rid of the cancer unless you have mitochondria talking to the bacteria and fungi. And so without the nurse mating of all of these non-human species outside and inside our cells, we're dead. 
we do not have life within us without the connection to this greater life around us. Ultimately, it's a story again of, are you gonna be an isolationist and try to kill everything around you? Everything is alcohol, hand sanitizer, and you're trying to sterilize the air you breathe and you're breathing in office buildings with recycled air all day and you get in a car that's off-gassing plastic and you keep your windows up and you're, you're, it's just, you know, we are so isolated on the macro level now. Our lifestyles have done that. And that's why our destination cities look like they are, right? And so the reason Colorado has a draw and I now live in Charlottesville, Virginia and I spend some time in California, a tiny town there too. It's these tiny little towns that still have real air, that still have outdoors trails, that can plug you back into nature. They are becoming the meccas of today because there's so little of it left. There's so little opportunity to be reconnected to nature. Our meccas should be nature. Our church should be under a tree. Our synagogue should be staring at the mountaintop. We should have this process and understanding of spiritualism that is very difficult to separate from naturalism because they are the same thing. Hmm. Yeah, there's there's a massive nature deficiency disorder in around the world. You know, in Japan, I think there's 72 forests that are considered therapeutic forest bathing. People just go into the forest. You don't have to take your clothes off and bathe. You just walk through them, and they're actually, you know, they've measured the therapeutic effect. So and that's a big thing in traditional understanding was to get into nature to actually build your immunity, to build rejuvenation and your vitality, which is really important. You mentioned something a minute ago that just flew by and it was like so important. How the microbiome actually relate to our, to, to keeping us, uh, to, to reconnecting us with the whole and, and or keep us separate. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so uh, this discovery came in 2012. My background in, in cancer was again in the mitochondria and I had been studying redox molecules. Redox, the word redox is a, contraction of two words, which is reduction and oxidation. Reduction is the, uh, the contribution of electron to any biochemical event, and oxidation is the absorption or tearing away of an electron. And so reduction and oxidation is ultimately about electron flow or electricity as it flows through lymph systems, vascular systems, you know, the water within your body, the, the water within your cells called the plasma or the cytoplasm, and then you've got this constant electrical energy flowing from cell to cell in a di basically just like digital energy. You can picture this like a liquid, liquid circuit board of information channels, switches and, and on and offs and I's and O's and all that digital world that we live in in our cell phones. That same thing is happening down at your cellular level all the time. So in an ideal world, you, your mitochondria would be making an enormous amount of these redox molecules that would be keeping a very constant electrical stimulus within the cells going to keep cell-cell communication going in the intracellular or inside the cell environment. What was lacking from our understanding at the time, and certainly my understanding in cancer when I was diving into that, was that there was an outside world to the cell. 99% of the scientists on the planet right now think that all of the important things that happen inside a human cell start at the membrane. It's a very new science that we're starting to realize, oh my gosh, the extracellular matrix, the lymph, like you mentioned, and all these other systems outside the cell are the regulators and the controllers and, the, and really where the intelligence happens. And then all of the individual cells are responding to that greater environment that's continuous. And of course, a 70 trillion celled organism with all these subspecialized cell types, over 120 different cell types in the body at a minimum, you've got all of these different cell types that need to be in communication all the time to understand their role within the greater system. Of course, that, that global knowledge and identity and coordination of effort isn't gonna come from inside a single cell. That wouldn't make sense. You need, you need the extracellular environment. You need the milieu of the highways and traffic areas between the cells are obviously gonna be where all the action's at. And so when we were in 2012 in my nutrition center, I left uh, academia in 2010, started a nutrition center in rural Virginia where we kind of had a big food desert. And I felt like if we could teach people in a food desert how to eat healthy enough to reverse chronic disease, then we'd have a scalable model for the country. And so I, I started a plant-based diet system and all of this. And during those first couple of years, we saw about 30% of those patients reading the textbooks, obviously. You put them on a healthy diet, everything goes away. Diabetes are gone, they can reverse cancer, they can do all kinds of magic if they will 
change their diet. But then there was 30% that were just kind of stuck. No matter what we fed them, inflamed, slowly declining, couldn't turn them around. Then there was a third that really challenged our paradigm of understanding where they were actually getting worse on health food. They literally would have increased inflammation, increased achiness, bloatingness, feel terrible on health food. And so they seem to thrive and feel the best on refined carbohydrates. And I'm talking about crappy food here. This is like, you know, hot dogs from the, from the Shell gas station. So how that was possible was defying my understanding until we kind of learned this whole relationship between the microbiome, your immune system within the gut lining and that gut lining itself. And what we have we've subsequently found was as we we're studying soil, because I had decided it may be these 30% of the people are actually getting some sort of toxin from their health food. And so we started studying soil, find out if we were missing nutrients or if they were picking up toxins or what was happening. And it's going through a 40 page white paper that a colleague of mine dropped brought in. And on, on this page, uh, middle page is this huge molecule that had this giant carbon backbone and then hanging off the end of it, a whole cluster of oxygen and hydrogen molecules that looked a heck of a lot like the redox molecules of my cancer research. And in that moment, I just, you know, it's one of those goosebump moments where you know your life has all been on purpose right up until this second so you can have the blinders taken off. It was a blinders off moment where I suddenly realized, oh my gosh, this, this molecule not only has redox potential, it has this giant carbon backbone that would keep it stable outside of a cell. And as soon as I found out that that molecule could be made by bacteria and fungi, it all clicked. Of course, this is, this is the story is you can't, the mitochondrial redox signaling can't leave the cell. It doesn't work outside the, the highly controlled environment of the internal cell environment. You have to have a stable molecule and that stable molecule would have to be able to carry hydrogen oxygen exchange of electrons through complex environments of differing pHs of your stomach and your small intestine and tissue compartments of the body that can vary in pH, osmolality, which is the amount of solute or water in any structure, changing dramatically from second to second, you'd have to have a stable molecule. And so the aha moment was, oh my gosh, I already knew that we were fully dependent on mitochondria for survival. I hadn't put it together with the larger outside world. And it suddenly, it was the proof in the pudding of why does the environment affect the human body so much. By this time, we had a lot of articles coming out of UCLA, UCSD, UCSF, and a lot of other schools around the world saying that the microbiome and bacterial patterns were correlating with the type of cancer people were getting. And this seemed totally ludicrous to a cancer researcher, myself at the time, because my model of how cancer happens had nothing to do with, with bacteria. It was all about the inside of the cell. And I was actually in a small niche of scientists that thought it was about the mitochondria. You ask any other oncology group and they think it's about the nucleus of the human cell. We had already figured out, well, it's probably not the nucleus of the cell, it's probably mitochondria. Mitochondria, when regulated, can do all kinds of things. But it can't be just about the mitochondria because the mitochondria aren't immediately changing all the time to our environment. And yet the bacteria, the fungi, and that ecosystem is. And that's the closing of the loop. Bacteria and fungi make a communication network in these redox molecules. In that communication, they speak right to the mitochondria. Yes, we've proved that. But it also speaks right to the human nucleus. Yes, we've proved that. To change the way in which proteins at the biology level are building these boundaries to create the silence, to create the self-identity, create the sense of purpose at the cellular level so that the whole 70 trillion organism cell of a human would coordinate its efforts to become a thriving on purpose being. In, incredible. I'm, cur I'm curious to know what the, how this, the potassium sodium pump and the, the sodium battery maintaining that, that electricity from the cell, you know, there's so much in, in ancient wisdom. They talked about crimi, which were the, which were bacteria. They talked about bacteria, invisible bacteria thousands of years ago. And, and when you read the detail of what they said, they said, you know, get rid of the bad guys, fix the hygiene. But they also said thousands of years ago for bacteria, they said change the environment. And when you look at ancient humans, a lot of two things jump off the page. The amount of fiber they had, the amount of fiber we have, you know, they had 120 times more than we do. And potassium, they had like 11,000 milligrams of potassium per day. We get about 1,000 milligrams of potassium a day. Those are the two things that jump off the page. 
and potassium without it, which our diet is loaded with sodium and very little in potassium because we eat so many salted processed foods, it changes the ability for those cells to make electricity. How does that impact the mitochondria that you're in the, the inner and excellular, the, the inter and extracellular environments? John, I'm, so, I'm having so much fun with this interview. I've been interviewed 10,000 times and this is so fun. You're, you, you are right on the money right now. Like, so the sodium potassium in the end is just a, a management tool for something much bigger and that's water. Uh, mm -hmm. Human longevity and our connection to biophysics and our information stream coming from whatever you want to call it, God, universe, deeper intelligence, the black hole, all of those are true statements with different lexicon put on it and all the same thing ultimately. We can't have connection to that deeper source of in, intention, knowledge, life itself, love without water. It's so mysterious to me. But the water molecule is perfectly designed to be a quantum physics carrier of information. This is why homeopathy works, right? You can dilute to the point where there's not a single molecule of your herb left and yet the information from that herb after colliding through you know, su yeah. success, um, uh, disruption of the water around that herb now carries more power than the herb ever did. And so this uh, kind of homeopathic capacity to the water within our bodies is, is gonna be very vital to any sort of life longevity, life health, healing, regenerative process. We cannot get water inside ourselves if we don't have a high electrical gradient held across a single cell membrane. So the sodium potassium pump you're talking about is not actually on the gut membrane, these big, huge barrier systems. That's on a single cell membrane, which is a tiny little cell varying between 10 microns and 50 microns. So one tenth of the width of a human hair to maybe half the width of a human hair. So these tiny little cells are covered with these, these channels that are highly regulated. And one of these is the sodium potassium exchange. As you get potassium to be really high within the internal side of the cell, inside the cell, you create a great, wonderful gradient to pull water in. Bizarrely, you would think that we'd have water pumps on our cells to get water inside the cell. If water is the most important tool for detoxification, life itself, self-identity, longevity, then we should have these very active processes in place to pump water inside our cells, and yet we don't have it. We have a path, this kind of indirect pathway of not just potassium, but many other electrolytes that need to be in play to create these gradients that then would passively pull the water inside the cell. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful design in the end because we weren't engineered for human bulletproof status. We were engineered to be in balance with nature. And it's a checks and balances, just like we have within a functional government. If the human starts to be so radically narcissistic that it would start to annihilate all life around it, i.e. the last 50 years, we've annihilated to the point of extinction 40% of life on the planet. That's happened. 40% of life on the planet is gone. And mm. in that time, we created the largest epidemics of disease in our time. We can even dial us down from the big macro scene of killing 40 species down to a single species and show its impact on human health. If you look at the, uh, the public health data from the 1940s to today and the advent of each uh, vaccine, and we're going back now to you know, smallpox, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, you know, going uh, into the tuberculosis stu studies done, and a lot of successful and unsuccessful vaccines. Every vaccine that we put into play in the public health sector, there was an increase in autoimmune disease and chronic inflammation. That's fascinating. One species out of the billions, you know, billions is only a slight ex exaggeration. We have 5 million species of fungi alone. And so if we can have that many fungi, we are just it's unbelievable how much life diversity we have. And yet we make a vaccine against one bug out of the trillions of, uh, of uh, viruses, out of the you know, millions of fungi, out of the hundreds of thousands of bacteria. And there's an impact on public health and it has to do with self-identity. Autoimmune disease ticks up. That means not only do you have chronic inflammation and stimulation in your immune system, your immune system had to get so confused on self-identity that it started to attack itself. Right. 
And so it's just an extraordinarily exquisite thing that our nature around us would define the health and wellness of these membrane receptors and the larger barrier systems of our gut lining, vascular lining, blood brain barrier, and those would dictate ultimately the ability to traffic water from one space to another within our bodies to not only prevent disease, but become regenerative. We are reliant on all of these different organisms to regulate the electrical potential behind that cell membrane. And the, the mitochondria certainly do that. So the mitochondria bring, once water is available to the mitochondria, the water breaks apart and we'll use four hydrogen, two oxygen and two electrons to create one ATP molecule. Adenosine triphosphate is the only fuel for the human cell. We don't eat glucose, we don't eat protein, we don't eat you know, fiber, we don't eat any of the macronutrients, fat, we don't eat any of that. We can't run on those things. We have to have the bacteria and fungi digest everything on your plate, turn it into a few macronutrients, fat and sugar that can be digested by the mitochondria that will take that energy in the form of electrons and combine it with the water to create ATP to create the fuel that you would run on. It's just so eloquently balanced. It's so perfectly designed to make sure that we do not become self-absorbed and narcissistic and, and isolationist in our species behavior we become aware of the importance of variety, the importance of, uh, of diversity. And it's obvious why our president and so many of our political structures around the world right now are going isolationist and building bigger walls between the countries and skin colors and everything else. It's because there is so much loss of sense of a self. There's so much threat to the self identity that people are starting to grope for these uh, you know, obtuse, you know, completely small-minded versions of, well, this is our club and you can't get in here and, you know, whatever it is, that is reflecting exactly what is happening to all of us is we've killed so much biodiversity on earth. Our soils have, are depleted. Our microbiome is depleted. We're eating and drinking antibiotics all day long. We are becoming alone and we are acting like it. Wow. So what's your, I mean, there's the solution, obviously many, but change your mind is critical. Change your behavior. You know, learn how to, instead of needing love, approval, appreciation, reward chemistry, be the love that you actually are. Because that's, uh, there's one study that talked about eudaimonic versus hedonistic giving, where you give hedonistically, where I hope you like the present I got you, where eudaimonically I give you this gift, but I don't really care if you like it. I just love giving it to you so much. Both of them changed the genetic code, but when they gave hedonistically, I hope you like the color, I hope it fits, it had a negative impact epigenetically on genetic code. When I gave it to you, I didn't care. I just loved giving it to you like the sun loves, just does it, it just gives light because that's what it does. And we are love and that's what we do if we let it happen. Then it literally changed the genetic code in a positive way. So the people we interact with can tell whether it's, hedonistic, where you're doing it with a hopeful, hopeful return on investment, or you're doing it because you're truly doing it from the goodness of your heart. You know, be good for goodness sake, because it's our nature to be that way. And that, I believe, ayurvedically tying that to modern science, which we try to do here, is really the, the, the crux. And, and we know in Ayurveda, they say 85% of all disease comes from your digestive system. We put all kinds of energy on digestion and lymph. And you look at the ancient wisdom, it's like the whole thing was about making sure the gut lining didn't get clobbered by stress, by emotion, by, by toxins. Yet, you, so that's the repair mechanism. And then, the, and then behaviorally, we must begin to engage in behavior of loving and giving and be kind and be good for goodness sake kinds of things. And, and learning to be love instead of needing love all the time seems to be you know, the, the ancient wisdom. But, but these, these days, like you said, we're so addicted to the reward chemistry, so addicted to, to that return to fill you up on a superficial level that we've lost our memory of proper function, which is called smirti, the loss of memory of how we can function as a whole. Not a whole as an individual, but a whole as what? As a state, as a community, as a globe. You know what I mean? It's a, it was one study that I blew my mind, I wrote about this, where they did studies with magpies, and they had like two magpies tried to figure out how to get into some food. They had 20 magpies, they figured it out. And they figured that, wait, is that because more people, more consciousness we have, the smarter we are? So they went back to the anthropology and they found that it wasn't the meat, it wasn't the, the fish, it wasn't the, the hunting and the cooking. It was communities. As we gained bigger tribes and came together, we got smarter. And that tripled our brain size. 
And that, to me, is where we need to realize is that when we come together, not isolate, we can triple our brain size again and do exactly what you're telling us the human potential is all about. I just think it's, I, I just think you're, you're, you're so brilliant. I'm so, so pleased to have you here and have, have uh, my listeners hear you because you're, you're, you're speaking this incredible ancient wisdom in such a modern scientific way that it really proves the direction that we have to go. Um, we are running out of time here. I'd love for you to you know, take a few minutes and, and, and wrap up. You, know, you can always find Zach at ZachBushMD.com. Wealth of information there. Please go there, check them out. But please, you know, if you could take a few minutes and just summarize you know, what you want us to know here. It's, you know, uh, it, it feels uh, like an unrealistic expectation that I can add to the wisdom you guys already have. I think that uh, I love what you just said there, the fact that we're all uh, growing brains by being together. I think uh, I see that happening in my own life so much. Um, I started my clinic in 2010 completely isolated. I was a lonely doctor and uh, it took me a while to build a new community after leaving academia for 17 years. And um, at the momentum that's now behind me is so extraordinary. And I see it uh, absolutely being a part of this thing you speak of, which is community. And I think Buckminster Fuller, if, if you guys are not familiar with Buckminster Fuller's work and a lot of his uh, writings and famous quotes, he, he's perhaps the best mind in the 20th century of understanding what society would look like if we start to live in concert with everything we're talking about today. Uh, he spoke very eloquently as to when we find a win-win scenario for every human on the planet, we will find a stable society. And he spoke on the steps towards that even as to what that would look like. Uh, one of the important, interesting things is he doesn't think anybody should work. Nobody should ever be paid uh, for some job they do. Instead, they should bring such worth to every exchange that they have that they would be paid, you know, that they would realize uh, wealth just through their contributions. And so he actually lived his life that way. He never had a job, he always, and he became profoundly successful in academia and beyond. And, uh, and was never academician in the true sense of the word, uh, being paid by some university. So very interesting life that he lived. And so I think we don't even have to have new wisdom. I think the wisdom has been with us through the Ayurvedic traditions, through the Japanese, through many of the European traditions, the Middle East, Africa, and there, South America certainly steeped in it. The Native Americans obviously had all of this, you know, integrated into their relationship to the greater nature and to the spirit and everything else. And so I think, you know, the exciting thing for me is that we are in complete crisis only because we created the crisis. If we stop creating the crisis, there will be no crisis. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't think there's ever been a crisis in nature uh, on this planet until we came along. There was transformation, there was change, there was, you know, extinction and rebirth, and there was movement of the species but then we've never seen this sort of this level of collapse since about 60 million years ago when that big catastrophic event happened an asteroid or something like that that suddenly wiped out the macro dinosaurs and the big life on earth and we kind of started over again at that point with micro life rebirthing in these environments and things like that so I would like to see transformation perhaps on Earth happen for the first time for the right reason instead of us waiting for the next asteroid or nuclear event to wipe out life on earth as we know it today, wouldn't it be cool if we could make that next jump through a stage of enlightenment and increased knowledge that we will find in the love, respect, and community that you've already proven out is going to grow our brains bigger. The brains are just the CPU chip. That's one of the fascinating things that we've learned from modern medicine is there is no memory in the brain. The only place is this tiny little spot, the RAM, that can maybe access memory, but it's not the storage unit for memory. Memory looks to be stored in your water, in your lymph systems, in the muscle, in the connective tissues of your body. Memory is collective. Knowledge is collective. Problem solving is collective. That's been proved out in university experiments with humans. You can actually get people to pro solve their problems quicker if 40 people are working on a problem than one. But even cooler than that, if you have another group across campus start that solving that same puzzle a few minutes later, 
that 40 people will solve it faster than the first 40 people because there was collective knowledge that was spanning out across that university in seconds as electrons were exchanged across that space. And there was more knowledge at the fingertips of the second group starting. That's extraordinary. If we can passage information, knowledge, and discovery through a nonverbal instantaneous communication network that we can't see, then we're gonna come up with the transformation fast enough when we just be silent to hear it. Incre incredible. I would love to have you back and take this even further. I think today in our culture, we're cleaning the pool. And you know how it happens when you clean a pool, right? It's got to get dirty first. Um, so we're in the midst of that. But uh, I have faith that it's going to get really clean. Definitely thanks to you know people like you and the work you're doing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'd love to have you back. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah. And, uh, and don't forget to check out uh, Dr. Bush's website at uh, www.com, zachbushmd.com. Check him out. And uh, thanks for listening. We're at uh, lifespa.com. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by LifeSpa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at LifeSpa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.